Introducing TurboGrafx-16, the next generation video game system. The PC Engine was the world's first 16-bit home console. With it came a library of games with a much closer experience to the arcade versions than people were used to at the time. Now, with so many great hardware options available, I want to show people looking to use original hardware how to get the best quality possible for all versions of the console. I'll be honest, the first time I tried a Turbo Graphics console was only a few years ago. It's not that I wasn't interested, it's just that no one I grew up with had one, so I never had the opportunity to try it out. It was awesome discovering the console's library on original equipment in RGB, but if you just want to check out the game library and see what it has to offer, maybe just start with emulation and see if it's for you. I'm sure some people would be happy just playing versions of the same games on different consoles, and other people might be content just playing on a Raspberry Pi or new and exciting solutions like the Mr. FPGA, as both provide a really good experience. This video is focused on people who've already decided they want to use real hardware and get the best possible signal available today from their Turbo Graphics or PC Engine consoles. So let's start with an overview of all the consoles available and their features. Everyone's console needs will be different, as some people might already have some hardware, while others might not have anything at all. Also, the console options do get a bit confusing, so I'll try my best to break everything down as easy as I can. First and foremost, PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 Hue cards are not directly compatible with each other, even though they look the same. CD-ROMs are universal, and ROMs and ISOs could be played across all consoles, but people looking to use original Hue cards would either have to use adapters like the PC Engine or install region mods to play both. Also, original TurboGrafx-16 controllers use a bigger connector than all other versions, including PC Engines and Turbo Duos. You can get controller adapters or even modify the multi-taps for compatibility, which does make things easier. I mainly show PC Engine consoles in this video just because that's what I have available to me, but you should choose whatever fits your needs best. Next, each console has both standalone versions as well as duo versions which have a CD-ROM drive built in but are missing the expansion port. The only exception to this is the enhanced Super Graphics console which was never released in a duo version. The Super Graphics is interesting as it gained some notoriety over the years even though only less than 10 official games were released for it. Either way, it's an option that's important to many people so it's worth mentioning. Being able to play CD games can be a bit confusing. Duo consoles can play most CD games without anything special, but all original consoles with the CD attachment require that a hue card be inserted into the console for discs to play in order to provide extra memory for the games. CD games released early in the console's life will work with all Super System cards, ranging from version 1 to version 3. Super CD games require later versions, and, just to confuse things, a handful of CDs like Altered Beast have compatibility issues with later cards. To make things even more complicated, towards the end of the console's life, another card was released called the Arcade Card. This would enhance some existing titles, with only a few titles such as Strider actually requiring it to run. To be clear, while duos don't require the Super System cards to run CDs, they do require the Arcade Card to run those games. And to make things even more crazy, there are two different arcade cards out there. So my suggestion is, if you need an arcade card, I guess try to hunt down the Pro Edition because it has more memory and could play all of the games across all of the consoles. A note for EverDrive users, the Turbo EverDrive ROM card can also act as a Super System card, but not the arcade card, which is still a cool bonus. There's other hardware out there like the portable Turbo Express, or things like the PCFX, but those don't really fall into the spectrum of this video, so we'll save those for another day. Okay, now on to output options. PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 consoles with an expansion port can get high quality RGB output without installing an internal amp. There's some great solutions out there with some pretty cool options, but there's a few things that you need to know before moving forward. First, since these devices use the expansion port, 
you won't be able to use them with the Duos. You also won't be able to connect a CD drive or optical drive emulator, as that's the only connection those could use. Next, it's worth noting that almost every one of these consoles will have analog interference, commonly referred to as jail bars, which require a modification to fix. More on this later, but I wanted to mention it now so people won't have any surprises if they skip the rest of this video and find jail bars on their plug-and-play solutions. Finally, as with every classic console, the quality of your cable will greatly affect the output, so make sure to use good cables with any solution, such as the ones linked in this description. Anyway, let's take a look at what, in my opinion, are the best choices out there. First is a device from DB Electronics called the Graphics Booster. This outputs composite, S-video, and RGB via a Genesis 2-style AV connector. It's even one of the few third-party devices that's officially supported by the HD Retrovision Genesis 2 cables. You can purchase this from Stone Age Gamer with a really nice case under the name Engine Block. The output quality is excellent and it's compatible with every PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16 console with an expansion port. One bonus is the simultaneous output, so you could do something like play S-Video on a CRT while streaming or capturing in RGB. For under $100, I think it's an excellent solution. Please note that there's a clone of this device on eBay that's very cheap, but designed and built very badly. I bought one myself just to verify, and confirmed that using it could potentially cause damage to your equipment, and if nothing else, it outputs pretty poor picture quality. Now for a pretty interesting option, the SSD S3. This device outputs RGB and composite video, but also doubles as a ROM cart and optical drive emulator. Let's go over its features. First, this can provide the entire PC Engine and Turbo Graphics library on one device. That includes Super Graphics games when you use it with the Super Graphics console, as well as all of the Super CD and even the arcade card CD games, as well as all Hue cards from every region. The SSD S3 also simulates the interface unit, which adds save backup and some additional memory. Also, setup is similar to most other ROM cards. Just format the card in FAT32, create some folders, add some BIOS files, ROMs, and CDs. That's it, just a basic config. The menu and interface is a bit confusing at first, since you have to toggle between Hue card and CD views, but it's not that big a deal and I got used to it pretty quickly. Although, I will warn you that a few times while shooting this video, I thought there was a problem with the card because it wouldn't show any of my CDs when I was actually just on the Hue card page. So even after using it for a while, it was still a bit confusing and I wish they would just allow all games to be accessed from one menu. Loading times are very fast, and as long as you're using the latest firmware, games play great. That's the first problem I wanted to mention though. In order to update the firmware, you need to create an account on the company's website, register the device, and download firmware customized to your personal serial number. Not only is this a pain, but it also makes selling your device complicated, as it would need to be transferred to the new owner. Also, what happens if the company ever goes out of business and yours has outdated firmware? How would you be able to upgrade? Unfortunately, the SSD S3's initial release did not go well. The device had some pretty serious RGB and audio issues. And to make things worse, the company's owner's a bit of a hothead and really not great at dealing with PR issues. Terra Onion, the company that makes the device, offered free replacements for the first batch with the really bad issues, but the version that's been shipping ever since still has some problems. I'll show them here, and as you're watching, please keep in mind that this is a $300 device. If this was $99, I'd be suggesting people just be happy with the great ROM cart, but this is supposed to be a premium device. Unfortunately, even months after its release, Terra Onion's response to this quality complaint was first to claim that the issues had been fixed, which we clearly can see they haven't, then they gave up altogether refusing to fix any of the issues because quality can't be measured. Seriously, that actually happened. That's a real tweet that still exists, and I'm pretty sure that's my favorite tweet of all time. I understand people get frustrated and overwhelmed, especially when you're trying to run your own company and build these amazing devices, but quality can't be measured? <laughs> well, lucky for us, quality can be measured, and some people got together and donated their time and efforts to fixing these issues. 
First, Voltar has both completely redesigned the video circuit and created a bypass board to fix existing SSD S3 devices. The manufacturing files for the board are freely available for people who want to build their own, and pre-made boards are also available for purchase. Check the description for links. Next, Firebrand X figured out the design flaw that caused the audio issues, and with the help of a few other experts, created an audio bypass that, as long as you use shielded cables, will get you audio output that's equal to the CD-ROM drive's original output. He sells the boards and offers optional installation as well. Mobius StripTech is offering installation services for both of these boards, and he assisted in all the original testing of the video bypass, so he could be considered an expert in this as well. Also, he lent me some equipment for this video, so I wanted to give a quick shout out. Okay, now let's do a quick comparison of what it looks and sounds like before and after both bypasses are installed. I gotta be honest, after implementing the fixes, this thing is awesome. Seriously, this device is really one of a kind. It's easy to use, plays every game, and is the only aftermarket device with arcade card support. The next revision is scheduled to be out soon, and prototypes have already been sent to testers. It looks like both fixes were applied, and all new versions will be fine, but I absolutely had to leave this info in here, because there's thousands of these out there now, so you should know what to expect if you get an old revision. One last thing to mention, as I was shooting this video, I noticed that the SSD S3 I borrowed was scratching my console's plastic. If you have a rare console like a Super Graphics, you might want to consider sanding down the plastic on the edges of the SSD S3, and maybe adding some felt in its place or something just to prevent any scratches or damage. I spoke to Alex, the owner of the company, and he assured me that the new version of the SSD S3 would be out soon, and that all future products from Terra Onion would go through a much more stringent testing phase. I really hope he's right, and that he's now found a way to measure quality. Next is a really unique device called the Upper Graphics that plugs into the expansion port and outputs 720p. This is a true digital-to-digital -digital solution, not an analog-to-digital conversion. It outputs via a DVI port, but with a simple converter or cable can be plugged directly into an HDMI jack and carries both audio and video. The picture quality is absolutely perfect, and since the signal is processed digitally, there are no jail bars whatsoever, regardless of what you'd find on the analog output of that same console. This is extremely unique and only possible because the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 as well as the GameCube are the only game consoles that present the digital video signals externally in a connector, allowing for a true digital plug-and-play device. Overall, I'd say that the video and audio quality is excellent and has absolutely no interference whatsoever. Also, like the SSD S3, this device acts as an optical drive emulator, and newer versions supposedly play cue cards as well. Unfortunately, this is where the device starts to fall short. First, unlike the SSD S3, the upper graphics requires the Super System or Arcade card to be in the Q card slot for compatibility with those games. Not too big of a deal, but that's an extra expense that should be taken into consideration, and there's really no reason why it couldn't have just been integrated right into the upper graphics. Also, at that point, you might want to consider buying an EverDrive 2, since the EverDrive can act as a Super System card as well as play ROMs. Next, the menu and configuration are extremely clunky and confusing, requiring Windows software just to load the games. Let's quickly run through the process. Initial setup requires you to format the card with an image similar to what you'd do with a Raspberry Pi image. Then you'd need to use confusing custom PC software to load each game. That's right, you can't just copy some games over like pretty much every other SD device, you need to load them individually through the software. To make matters much worse, games must be ripped in a very specific way using CD manipulator, otherwise they won't work at all. If you don't feel like re-ripping your entire collection, you might be able to get away with just changing one of the files that's created with the CD image, the CCD file, 
changing that to say CD manipulator, changing one setting, and then just renaming the file. After that, you could load it up just as if you'd ripped your own, but this is still a really tedious process to go through, especially for people who've already taken the time to rip all their own games. After you're finished loading games, insert the SD card into the upper graphics and power on the console without any hue card in the slot. This will bring you to the upper graphics configuration menu, which in my opinion is pretty confusing, so I'm just going to concentrate on the things that might be most important to you. I'll start with the aspect ratio settings because they didn't work the way I expected. 4x3 and 3x3 are the main modes, and 3x3 is what you'd see for a pixel perfect aspect ratio, but the goal of playing on digital displays is always to mimic the aspect ratio of a CRT and get that as close as possible. So while 4x3 is closer, it still feels a little too wide for me. The 4x2 and 3x2 modes are actually the same thing, just with scan lines added. So if you look at all four on screen right now, you can see that there's only two aspect ratios, not four. So really, it's just kind of a labeling issue. And the scan lines look pretty good, but I'm not gonna get into those because they never look good through a YouTube video. They only really look good in person. So check them out for yourself if you're interested. And as for which aspect ratio to use, I guess I'd stick with four by three, but if you have a capture card or a display that allows you to adjust the width, then I would try both and see which you could make look whatever looks best to your eyes. Next, V-Sync frequency is kind of important because if you leave it at 60 hertz, it'll be compatible with everything. Whereas if you put it at 59.83 hertz, it might not be compatible, but you'll get a smooth image on displays that are compatible. So for example, my OLED TV seemed to be compatible with 59.83, and it was a really perfect experience, but my capture card wasn't. So you might notice sometimes in these videos, because it's set to 60 hertz, I'll occasionally get a screen judder or tearing. But overall, it doesn't look bad, and it's certainly not nearly as bad as something like the original Super Game Boy. The disk number preset is how you select whichever CD image you want to load, and it's kind of strange. I'm not sure what block is, and disk is whichever disk you would like selected when it boots. And if you go into image list, this is just a list, so you can move up and down or skip by page, but this is just a list so you know what disk number each game is. So if you press 2 to go back to menu, there's really nothing else to do here. Um, the disc is selected at number 5, so that's the game we want to boot, and run doesn't do anything, 1 and 2 buttons just skip by 10, and uh, select just sets everything back to uh, whatever the default settings are. So I'm going to leave this at Lords of Thunder again and launch that, but right now there's no there's nothing to do in order to launch the game, which is strange. You just then need to turn the console off, then insert the Super System card and power the console back up. And this brings you to the normal CD-ROM run menu. And when you press run, then it loads the game. So it's a little bit strange in how it works. Uh, I think you just, uh, whenever you set the disk image, it automatically remembers that and then loads that once the Super System card accesses it. But pretty much every single thing about this menu could be improved, and I really hope it is at some point. I spoke to the creator of the upper graphics about these issues, and I was really disappointed in his answers. I even enlisted the help of a translator who lives in Japan to make sure this wasn't just a language barrier issue, as communication is something that's really important to me. The creator said this device is designed for people to rip and play their own games, and he'll never support piracy and loading of generic ISOs. I reminded him of the many people out there who have already painstakingly ripped their own collection to get a perfect dump, but he wouldn't budge on the issue. The version of the upper graphics I use doesn't support cue cards, but I can only imagine ROM support on newer versions might be similarly painful. While I love the output of this device, the price makes all of this really hard to swallow. At $400, I would have hoped for a fully functional optical drive emulator with all of the cards installed and ROM card support. Honestly, the upper graphics creator's attitude was really disappointing. ROMs and ISOs are something that's important to many people, and I know lots of collectors with original CDs that would still much rather play an ISO than take out their old and sometimes finicky CD drives. 
Once again, I did use a translator because I wanted to make sure this wasn't a language barrier. That's something that's always really important to me. But throughout the conversations and emails, I was really just let down every time I talked to him. Even with things like potential RGB output, he kind of just blew it off and said he didn't think anybody would care or want that. So it was kind of rough, but overall, this device is definitely good for some people, but because of its price and because of the features that are almost there, but not quite, it's definitely not for everybody. One other plug and play device worth mentioning is this RGB cable with a video amp built right in from Fide in Sweden. Apologies if I'm pronouncing that wrong. It's a good choice for someone that just wants a basic RGB output cable with no extra features. But if you choose this option, please make sure you buy from the exact seller I linked to below because I've seen some really crappy copycat designs that definitely aren't built for the same standards. I'm not spending too much time on this device, not because there's anything wrong with it, but because it just acts exactly as you would expect it to. Plugs right into the expansion port and outputs high quality RGB. So this is a great device for people that only want cue card support from the non-duo consoles. Now, I know most people watching this won't care about composite video, but I did want to warn everybody. There's some devices out there like the ones from Hyperkin that plug into the expansion port and give you composite video as well as stereo audio. But those devices don't have any components in them, meaning they could be potentially dangerous for your devices. I believe you'd want at least some kind of filtering capacitor inside, but those devices, as well as a lot of do-it-yourself guides I've seen on the internet, say that you don't need them. Please don't do that, and please make sure that you're safe with these old consoles, because these things definitely have a finite lifespan, and we want to keep them alive as long as possible. Before we get into internal RGB mods, I need to address a problem that plagues all of these Turbo Graphics and PC Engine consoles the analog interference known as jail bars that I showed before. Some consoles will be worse than others, but if you're playing on a flat screen TV, the interference can be really distracting and take away from the whole experience. Luckily, Tim Worthington figured out the root of the problem and identified a few capacitors that, if replaced, will fix the issue on most consoles. Unfortunately, that means even with the plug and play options, some internal modification is necessary but in some cases, it's really easy to do. Check out this Super Graphics. All you need to do is remove the bottom cover and swap out these two caps here. The procedure is pretty similar for all models, and Console 5 has info on which caps need to be replaced on each revision. Speaking of capacitors, another serious problem with many of these consoles, and especially the duos, is leaking capacitors. Not only will this cause your console to fail, the capacitor fluid will corrode the motherboards and could cause permanent damage. This isn't a scary news tease either, as I've seen many duos completely ruined by leaking caps damaging traces on the board. As a result, it's my opinion that you should consider a cap replacement a required mod on all duo consoles. Full cap replacements on the standalone models aren't always necessary, but I strongly recommend at least opening them to check for leaks. But keep in mind, it's not always as obvious as the pictures I'm showing here. Console5.com sells some high quality cap replacement kits, and many good modders offer this service as well. Keep in mind that modding price will vary since repairing board damage can be a tremendous amount of work. Also, super graphics owners should all take a note of one huge design flaw. The plastic shown here on the bottom of the case has been shown to occasionally do serious, irreversible damage to the motherboard. Even though I normally hate cutting plastic, I strongly recommend every single Super Graphics owner snips this small piece just to make sure the console doesn't get damaged. One way to get a near perfect output from any PC Engine or Turbo Graphics console is by adding an internal RGB amp. Also, all of these consoles can be modded without cutting the plastic, either by replacing the existing DINs with a new one, or by using the RF hole, making it a true no-cut mod. I originally shot footage of both a cap replacement and an RGB install on my core graphics, but for the first time ever, I lost all the footage. Luckily, Voltar was nice enough to let me use clips of his videos to show his installation methods. Basically, installing an amp in all consoles goes like this. Tap RGBS either directly from the correct hue chip or from the corresponding pins on the output connector. Then, wire that 
as well as power and ground to a mod board. Next, you'll want to install a custom DIN connector which fits in the existing DIN location on PC Engine and Duo units. Retro Access sells the proper ones for PC Engine units, as well as cables to match, but keep in mind these DINs will require a modification. Voltar's videos explain this perfectly, so I'll leave links below. A quick note, if you're using a TurboGrafx-16, you can remove the RF modulator, score the PCB, and solder a DIN connector upside down directly to the board. If done right, it's a really secure install method, and you can choose which mini DIN fits your setup best. Both major RGB cable sellers offer mini DIN 8 pass-through cables, making that my preferred method. Some people like to use a Genesis 2 Mini DIN 9, but please do not use that connector unless you're familiar with all of its caveats, otherwise it won't work at all. Since there's no output connector, an internal mod is required for all duo consoles, but still might be a great choice for Core Graphics and TurboGrafx-16 consoles, depending on your setup. Heck, some people might do it just for the clean, factory finish look. Now that I've laid out all the options, let's go over what might be right for you. I'll approach this from a perspective of someone that doesn't already own any Turbo Graphics or PC Engine hardware. If you already own any of the console equipment or even other retro gaming equipment like an open source scan converter or frame meister, you'll have to take all of it into account and choose what's best for you. Please note that the signal from all of these consoles might be a problem with modern displays, even when using upscalers. Heck, even some RGB monitors don't like the signal. While there's not much you can do about it, compatibility is something you'll always have to keep in mind when using original hardware in pretty much all of these older consoles, but the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics are definitely known as problem units, so just something to keep in mind. Let's start with the non-Super Graphics options. If you're looking to play original discs and original Hue cards, I'd recommend the Duos with a full recap done to it. You can choose Turbo Graphics or PC Engine based on which region Hue cards you're looking to play, or just find the cheapest one available to you and use a converter or region switch. The consoles vary in price, but I've seen them for around $300, plus about $250 if you want to include the recap, RGB installation, boards, and cables. So pretty much the cost of everything, including refurbishment. If you'd like to play backups as well as originals, add around about another $100 for a stack of good quality blank CDs and an EverDrive. Including that, you're looking at a total of over $650 for a solution that can play everything that's not including super graphics or arcade card games. If you're only looking to play original Hue cards and CD-ROMs don't matter to you, you're looking at a far cheaper solution. You can pick up a Core Graphics or Turbo Graphics for around $150, then either use an RGB plug-and-play solution or perform an internal installation. If you don't have a region preference, I prefer the Core Graphics consoles because they're small, come in a variety of colors, and perform very well, making them easy to integrate in whatever existing setup you already have. The total, including RGB cable, will be about $250, give or take what you paid for the console, and you could either add a region switch or EverDrive for about $100 more. If you don't mind using ROMs or ISOs instead of original games, my recommendation is a Core Graphics and an SSD S3. Just remember that if you have one of the versions that needs repair, there's two mods that you definitely need to do. First, it's my opinion that you must install Firebrand X's audio in. The noise is just too awful without it. Next, you need at least one video mod, either internally on the console or on the SSD S3. You might just want to mod the SSD S3, since you can't have both RGB modded, and if you use a console amp, you'll still need to remove the existing video circuit from the SSD S3, otherwise it'll be drawing twice the signal from the console. Having both amps installed would definitely add interference and could potentially damage your console. And that's actually something to note for any of these solutions. Don't have both an internal analog solution and an external analog solution going at the same time. Either way, a Core Graphics and an SSD S3, including an RGB cable and all mods required, will come in under 600. That's still cheaper than the Duo solution, but much more expensive than people who don't want CD support and can spend 350 on the previous solution with an EverDrive. 
Once Terra Onion releases the version with both audio and video fixes implemented, you could really have a true plug and play solution that'll be a lot cheaper, and the only mod you'll have to worry about is the same jail bar mod you'd have to do on every one of these consoles. I recommend getting them from Stone Age Gamer, and I believe the older version is currently on sale, making the upgrades a little bit easier to swallow. So I think that takes care of the options most people would probably end up purchasing, ranging from 250 to 600. But now let's take a look at some of the special use cases. There isn't a duo version or a turbo graphics version of the super graphics, so your choices here are limited. For me personally, I'd use ROMs and not install a region switch if I wanted to use a super graphics, as I like to do as little mods as possible to such rare and expensive consoles. You'd need to purchase a CD unit to play original discs, but I think either a fully modified SSD S3 or the upper graphics in an EverDrive might be the best option for super graphics users. You can play pretty much the entire library of games and never worry about modding the console. If you're only playing on a flat screen, don't mind the convoluted way to get disc images on the device and the aspect ratio doesn't bother you, this might be worth the money. Keep in mind you'd still need to buy either a Super System card or an EverDrive or the arcade card to play all of the disc games, so you'd probably just want to pick up maybe an EverDrive or an arcade card if you really just want to play the entire library. This might also be a good option for professional streamers as well, as you could RGB mod the console itself and connect that output to a CRT for gaming while using the upper graphics output to send 720p HDMI to your capture card without using any external scaler. This is completely safe to do since the internal RGB mod uses the analog lines and the upper graphics uses the digital lines which are completely separate. I guess that would be the ultimate PC Engine experience though. The super graphics with an internal RGB mod, an upper graphics, an EverDrive, and an arcade card. Heck, let's even throw in an original Super CD for people that want to use original discs and capacitor replacements for both the console and CD drive. With shipping, you're pushing two grand, which definitely isn't for everyone, but I guess something to dream about. So as you can see, playing on original consoles is awesome and there's many options, but it's very expensive. I think for many people, using emulation or just playing the same games that are released on different consoles might be the best option. I'm really interested to see how accurate projects like the Mr. FPGA can get, as those have the potential to have every single option that the most expensive option I mentioned has, but for less than the cost of the cheapest solution I mentioned. Now that of course all comes down to the accuracy of the FPGA cores, and all of the different controller adapters and latency that might be added, but that's a serious statement. You might be able to use a very inexpensive device to get the same exact quality and feature output as well over $1,000, and the Mr. FPGA, as well as other platforms, support multiple consoles instead of just one. Now, for all of us out there who are chasing the best experience on original hardware, we have some good options, but nothing in my mind that I'd call perfect. For me personally, I think the perfect solution would be something like the SSD S3 that simultaneously outputs via HDMI through the digital pins. So kind of like an upper graphics and an SSD S3 combined. One thing that I'm not even sure is possible that I think would be cool is having a device like that with pass-through pins so that you could take something like a Super CD drive and plug it into that while still utilizing the device's arcade card or video outputs, but still allowing you to use original CDs. To be perfectly honest, I think that might just be wishful thinking and that might not even be possible, but whatever, it's just speculation and something I'd like to see. Either way, all that means to me is all these years later and all these awesome devices later, there's still room for more and still cool things that we could come up with. Well, that's it for this one. Thank you so much to everybody who helped make this video happen, and of course, thank you to all of my supporters, because without your help, none of these videos and none of these things could ever be made. Also, if you're interested, check out the weekly podcast that keeps everybody in the loop of everything going on in the retro gaming scene, as well as lots of the other videos and reviews that I've done. And of course, like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video.